This program is sponsored in part by the Center for Freedom and Prosperity and the Vernon K. Kriebel Foundation. I'm from Appalachia, a coal miner's daughter. For hundreds of years, people settled here to find freedom. They persevered by relying on themselves and their family to survive. Nice. Very nice. But my home has changed. We've lost our self-reliance. Appalachia has been left to fail. I'm Emerald, a proud Appalachian, and I want to thrive, not just survive. So I'm going to Washington, D.C. and team up with famed economist Dr. Richard Ron, and together we will find those people around the globe who are thriving against all odds. You can find style and originality in the most unexpected places. My line is mostly reuse, recycle, and uh, make uh, new garments from old, old things. Even I can make uh, custom, custom size, custom made. Even if you bring your husband's shirts, I can make. Uh, oh, from you make this. something out of. Yes. Oh, that's neat. <laughs> Marili Ruba is a clothing designer and mother who based the name of her line on a children's song after winning a design contest to get her business started. El tricadrei, uti karu komerei, something like that. That's cute. Do you ship to other places in the world? Uh, yes, of course. Greenberg Clothing is recognized for transforming cast-offs into high fashion. And she isn't alone. Another company developed in this tiny country is literally bringing the world together. The beginning of the Skype was 13 years ago. And the company was established as a yet another startup company. In the spring was the company established. And the first launch happened on 29th of August. Then just a few months later, we had 1 million downloads of Skype and 300,000 users using it. Andres is in the vanguard of the technological age. One man with a vision and drive that transformed how we communicate with each other. He founded Skype, which has become one of the most recognizable trademarks in the entire world. It was a proof that you don't need to be in Silicon Valley to make something big and change the world. And when people realized that, it helped them to pursue their dreams and start building things without needing a big budget or moving to states. And from there, obviously, we have people who had enough money to support and uh, fund the startups done by Estonians because we had belief that those guys can actually deliver. Skype was very good in timing. That was a time when people needed the new way of communicating. What do Skype and Little Greenbird Clothing have in common? They both originated here in Estonia, a tiny country situated on the Baltic Sea with a population of just over a million people. 25 years ago, Estonians were part of the Soviet bloc. With an inflation rate of 1,000%, unemployment at 40%, famed economist Dr. Richard Ron witnessed those dark days. I was here in December 1989, just a couple weeks before Christmas. And at that point, the Soviet Union was already crumbling. Most of Eastern Europe, other than the Baltics, had already acquired their freedom. But at the time, there was a small Christmas tree standing here, sort of straggly, and it had just a few little electric lights on it, like six. And they were being allowed to have the first Christmas concert series in the church, I guess the first time in 40 years. Estonians had seen a ray of hope in a series of demonstrations that is now collectively known as the Singing Revolution. Estonia declared its freedom from Soviet rule. Thousands of Estonians gathered together in Tallinn's large amphitheater to sing songs of Estonian national pride. And it was so emotional and moving at the time because you see the people, they were getting their freedom. In another show of solidarity, more than two million people from Estonia to Lithuania join hands in what is now known as the Baltic chain. Everybody had a strong sense of freedom because for 40 years fought against communist occupation, so we wanted to be free. Finally, in 1991, Estonia's efforts were realized. 
uh, we have decided to uh, include the Baltic states as a group. And the country became a free country recognized by major powers throughout the world as an independent republic. Estonian success is nothing short of a miracle. In 1991, the average GDP per capita was a mere $2,000. Estonians had their freedom, but little else. When you get the country which is having 1,000% inflation and 30% of economical drop and mostly 40% of working force, becomes unemployed, so it's not very fun. Today, Estonia is a very different place. This tiny country scores very high on the Human Development Index. It is the most free out of all the 15 of the former Soviet republics, and among these countries, ranks number one in real per capita income, political freedom, life expectancy, Human Development Index, and many others. The country has been nicknamed E-Estonia because it is one of the most advanced countries in the world when it comes to its e-government, by which many government functions, including voting, are handled over the internet. Now imagine paying taxes and setting up a business in less than five minutes. Under Estonia's e-residency program, 10,000 people have done just that. Uh, I started about eight years ago with my, with my company. Now it's even easier. Your uh, taxes or you can make with this uh, little cart. Estonian citizens use a unique identification card to perform secure online government functions. Estonians like Eva can even access such functions via mobile ID enabled SIM cards. I can sign uh, different kind of documents very easily without even going to the meetings, without uh, meeting all the people. We can, uh, uh, with this ID card, just we, we put it to the computer and we sign the documents and send it via email uh, to each other. We can actually also travel. Uh, we don't need to bring our passport when we're traveling inside EU. Then we can log into banks, we can make bank transfers. I'm a mother of two. So basically, if my son gets a bad uh, grade at school, <laughs> he doesn't, uh, and maybe he doesn't want to tell me, I see it before he arrives home. <laughs> this ID card also has an extension uh, in mobiles, which is mobile ID. So basically, I have it in my mobile, and I can check all the things from my mobile also. I don't even need a computer. This e-government function is the brainchild of the former prime minister. I did this for personal purposes, largely because I was just lazy. I didn't want to carry all these papers on the press conferences. And then I said, no, that's it. So we will not carry them. We we'll just do them directly. Mark Lahr joined the fight for a better Estonia, becoming prime minister of the country at a shockingly young age. No, I, I was not yet 33, I was 32. No. And of course, I must say, quite a big part of my government was even younger. So 26 and 27 and so on. So when we first time went to the European um, Council, then the security didn't want to let us in because they just say that some students or boys are coming <laughs> and nobody of them looks like a prime minister, which is true. So I didn't look like prime minister very much. <laughs> When Estonia emerged from behind the Iron Curtain in 1991, the society was decades behind the rest of the world in technological innovation, having missed the progress experienced by the Western world from the 60s to the 80s. But as is the Estonian nature, they looked at this as an opportunity rather than a crisis. Cybernetica, a company that spun off from the Institute of Cybernetics, helped to develop much of the technology used in e-government. Uh, secure networks for police, border guards, customs, those were first big projects. Uh, then we did lots of works on the certification, digital signatures, helped to do the pilot project for our ID card, uh, develop firewalls, VPN systems, this kind of stuff. Technically, it's a very simple thing. It's uh, just a small chip that contains cryptographic keys for authentication for digital signature. Estonia passed the Digital Signatures Act in 2000, which made signatures valid whether signed on paper or PC. 
The basic building block of this system is the unique ID number that is used across all systems from passports to banking to government offices. Estonia takes protection of this ID number very seriously. If somebody violates your privacy, if somebody really collects data from different governmental authorities and then tries to correlate them, then it is possible to detect that this happened, it is possible to find out who did it, and there is a means to punish those people. Trust, first of all, in, uh, in technology and how technology can change things and make your life easier. Um, the polit politicians had actually trust in engineers. Under former Prime Minister Lars' administration, the country established rule of law, eliminating much of the corruption. It also adopted a flat tax and implemented strong protections for private property, free markets, considerable trade freedom, and the lowest debt GDP ratio in Europe. Under his leadership, the economy started growing at around 7% a year, foreign trade increased by 25% a year, and taxes fell, which made it easy for anyone in Estonia, indeed across the globe, to open a business in their country. It became an incubator for pioneering business ideas, for its newfound transparency, streamlined government, and its size. Motivated young innovators not afraid to take risks would help launch a digital revolution. It was a very interesting time to you know, grow up to be a teenager because you had mm -hmm. all this new information and all these new things around you and you could actually get involved and you could take part. So that's why it was kind of easier uh, for the younger people to, uh, to get involved in politics. Its capital city of Tallinn, the best preserved medieval city in northern Europe, has shed its dusty gray history and provides a colorful tourist delight for travelers from all over the globe. Stores filled with Estonian-made goodies and wonderful restaurants for world-class dining. Tourists can sip on the local specialty of mulled wine to stay warm while taking in the sights and sounds of medieval Estonia. With easy access to the Baltic Sea and its groundbreaking open trade policy, Estonia has a very high trade-to-GDP ratio. But perhaps that's just another way Estonia reflects its history as it forges ahead into the future. But down there is what uh, historically was actually Tallinn, the, the city of traders. And uh, in the medieval times, it was a very important trading city between the east and west, probably like one of the richest cities in the, in the area. Uh, merchants lived out, down there and you had landlords who lived up here. It was a free city, it was part of the Hanseatic League. Serfs or slaves escaped from the countryside. They could stay in the city for uh, one year and one day. They could become uh, free citizens as well. So now, one of the things that Estonia kind of re-established was that we became more and more open to the trade, as we have historically been. So if you look at our trade to GDP ratio, 165% to GDP, so we are very, very uh, big open traders. And obviously now when we are in the European Union, we have the you know, free trade with all the EU, EU nations. I think in a way it builds on this historical uh, legacy of Hanseatic League, uh, connecting different uh, cities in the uh, Northern Europe so that they could like benefit from that. So. During Soviet times, Westerners had only one hotel choice when visiting Estonia, the Hotel Vero with its secret 23rd floor, whose only patrons were KGB spies listening in on the various hotel guests. Today, it's one of many hotels like the Hotel Telegraph in Tallinn, hosting tech leaders coming to Estonia to talk openly about their newest innovations. The emphasis is always looking towards the future, not dwelling on the past. In a post-Soviet 1991 Estonia, the odds looked impossible. The Iron Curtain had lifted, but there was still a heavy load of obstacles facing the small republic. But with a resilient mindset, a willingness to get the key infrastructure right, and an openness to continually reinvent it, innovation, a culture conducive to startups, and an investment in trusting its people, Estonia ranks at the top of all former Soviet countries and even competes with other world leaders. Estonia today is a very different place than Richard Braun witnessed when he was here in 1989. You just feel very good. You know, it's uplifting to see, again, a modern city here and uh, people who are well-dressed, well-fed, and part of the developed modern world, and that's so much different 25 years ago. Out of all the places I've been to around the world, Estonia just might be the most improbable success. Oh, it